Uh, something that's been pretty transformative for me is Father Dennis from St. Philip and Easy has been publishing the names of the folks who have died without an abode um, in Orange County, and he does a service once a month. But reading those names, contemplating those names, remembering those names, help remind me of why. <coughs> Sometimes even with some of this work, even like building housing, it can seem so up here, but it makes a difference for the folks who are living it. And I know um, that that's one of the compelling things that keeps me going. So right now I thought just for a moment, I'm gonna read the 48 names <coughs> of those who died in Orange County. Well, one of the things that I realized pretty early on is that I wanted to get clergy together in a room, <laughs> scary thought, um, and to talk theology a little bit, even a scarier thought. Um, but uh, I, I, became, I became friends with a gal, her name's Jill Shook, she comes from Pasadena, she has an organization called Making Housing and Community Happen, and uh, began to read her book and, and uh, loved what I was reading, and so Jill has, has sent um, a good friend of hers who is going to be, um, who's going to lead us in this next section on a theology of land use. And uh, Bert has been working for, for making housing hap and community happen for 19 years or so um, as a volunteer and as a community organizer. And the last, how many years? Four? Four, yeah. four years or so, pre-pandemic, um, as an employee of them. He's also an ordained pastor through the Pacific Southwest Mennonite Church. And uh, so he's an author of, a, he's got a book called Subversive Wisdom, Sociopolitical Dimensions of John's Gospel, and a podcast that he has. So I'm really excited. She just told me he's a theology nerd. And so, <laughs> so we're excited to have you, Bert, come and, and uh, lead us in a non-controversial -con topic, right, that we, all can, that we all come together on. But I'm uh, really thrilled that you can be here to share with us. Excellent, thank you. Um, <coughs> So it's, a, it's an honor to be here, uh, to speak to this group, uh, not just because you're leaders in the community, but because you've gathered uh, to do some work. Uh, you're not just hearers of the word, you're doers of the word. Um, and usually when I speak to groups, uh, they might be contemplating doing something, but um, this is a group that actually is, wants to put something into practice, so I'm uh, really honored to be here. Uh, and as, um, uh, as Jay said, I'm, I'm kind of a, a Bible geek. Um, and so I, I like the, you know, to talk theology, but you know, doing it is, is what we really need to be doing. So um, housing and land in the Bible. Um, so Israel was having a severe housing crisis in the eighth century BC. And we know that because um, Isaiah was talking about it. So Isaiah said, Woe to you who add house to house and field to field until there is room for no one but you, and you are left to live alone in the land. Now when, uh, what Isaiah is describing here is the wealthy buying up land and houses and, and then displacing the common people, the poor, right? This is what he's describing. Well, when we see that happening today, what do we call it? Gentrification. Gentrification, right. We need gentrification. There it is. Gentrification. So this is gentrification in the 8th century BC, in ancient Israel, 2,700 years ago. Gentrification described in the Bible, right there. And by the way, as we get into this, I, I wanted to uh, just you know, caution us. When it comes to economic justice, the Bible is a lot more aggressive than we are. So hold, on. so hold on. So you can you can see the, from what Isaiah says there. But it wasn't just in the uh, eighth century, uh, or not just Isaiah in the eighth century. Micah also um, is talking about this. Um, can I have a volunteer to read this? Somebody would be willing to read this. I'll read it. Alas, for those who devise wickedness and evil deeds on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in their power. They covet fields and seize them, houses and take them away. 
Micah chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. So Micah's describing the same thing. He's, he's in the same century as Isaiah. He's describing powerful people with power and wealth, uh, taking houses and land from the common people. But it wasn't just in the 6th century, uh, in the 8th century. Also, a 6th century prophet, Ezekiel, was talking about it. Can I have a volunteer read this one? Thus saith the Lord God, Enough, O princes of Israel, put away violence and oppression, and do what is just and right. Cease your evictions of my people, says the Lord God. Ezekiel 45, 9-10. Right, so here we have, again, another prophet uh, speaking out about powerful people taking uh, land and, 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 and evicting people, displacing people. So this comes up constantly in the prophets. And so now, when the prophets make this, these kinds of statements, what are they doing? What do we call that when people make these kinds of statements? Chastening. Chastening? That's one, one, one. Okay, so this is chastening. And, um... Rebuke. Rebuke? Okay. I, I probably should have phrased my question better. What I'm looking for is advocacy. Um, uh, so are you rebuking us? Or? <laughs> So, so this, this, is, this is the rebuke part of that. Right? If, we had, if, we, if we had more time uh, to look at the, at the, at the prophets, uh, we would see that they do cast a constructive vision for what they want society to be like. Uh, but this is the part where they're calling out the problem itself. So I wanted to mention that because Jill wanted me to include uh, theology of advocacy in my presentation, but there really isn't a lot of time for that. So, right, I, so today I'm just going to try to lay the foundation of Housing and land justice. Uh, I could do a whole other, you know, teaching on, um, or we could do a whole other teaching on, on advocacy and organizing. Um, but advocacy is actually kind of easy to see in the prophets, uh, and it may be a little less easy, but not too hard to see in in the gospels as well. It's once you start seeing it, once you start realizing it's there, it's all over the place. And advocacy is is very important to the work that we're doing. These. Uh, Working on the housing element, uh, that was described, uh, SB4, I think is what you were referring to. It, we're getting SB4 packs, rezoning uh, religious land and college land across California. That's advocacy. That work is very important. But um, so here, where's my next slide? slide. Okay, so, um, but one, one question we, we should ask ourselves when we're, when we're looking at reading these uh, statements by the prophets is, what was what the powerful and the wealthy were doing? Was it legal or not legal? Because gentrification and other processes that cause housing crises are generally legal processes, <coughs> and they're done often <coughs> by very nice people, right? Now there might be some of them that are jerks if you met them, but more, probably a lot of people that are involved in uh, in buying up land and houses like this. If you meet them, they're probably really nice people with families, and they go to church, and they tithe, or they put something in the offering plate, they, they, they tip their, their waitress, they, they give to charity. They're probably pretty nice people. It's just that they have a lot of money, and so they're going to use it. They have extra money. They're going to buy up land and houses for investment or second home or third home or whatever. You know, They have extra money, and what's wrong with that? Right? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with buying extra stuff that you don't need? I mean, when we have extra money, we buy things we don't need, right? And you know, we you know, when we buy clothes, do we worry about what was made in a sweatshop in Bangladesh? Mm. Or you know, with our, our, our smartphones, do we do we when we buy them, do we think about the rare earth minerals that are in our smartphones and the people that toil in the mines in other countries under very harsh conditions, often children, so that we can have smartphones. I drove down here from Pasadena. It took me, I don't know, 40 minutes. didn't hit much traffic. I put gas in the car. Do I worry about uh, the environmental degradation that's happening, happening through that? And the answer is yes, I do, but I did it anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, the point is that we're not talking about just individual sin, right? We're talking about a whole system that we're all caught up in. And we don't necessarily know the people that we're harming. And it's it's our everyday economic activity that does this. 
But there was, turns out there was a major Israelite legal foundation that was being, uh, that was being violated. And that is that God owns the land. This was the basic understanding in Israel, in Israelite law, that God owns the land. And that human ownership rights are neither absolute nor long-lasting. So God owns the land. Now, this is a theme that's constant in the Hebrew Scriptures, in what we call the Old Testament. God owns the land. Now, but we may not realize it because that word land, it's the Hebrew word eretz. And it can be translated either land or earth. And usually it's translated land. But for some reason, when the people who are translated into the English, when it talks about God owning the land, they often translate it as earth. So it comes across as, you know, the earth is the Lord's. Right? So now you, now you recognize it, right? It's a theme that's over and over again. But it's but the, the, the problem with that is ancient people they, they you know they didn't think like we do because we have the benefit of modern science right they weren't thinking about the earth as a globe the way we do they're thinking about the land under their feet and when we say the earth is the Lord's that's nice and it should give us pause to think about you know what we do on the earth what we do with the earth is important because it belongs to God but mostly it's it, that's a grandiose phrase right. And we might even think of it as a, as a praise. And so we just, we're praising God and then we go, kind of go and do whatever we, you know, we want to do anyway. But if we say the land belongs to God, the land is the Lord's, it's a little bit more immediate, right? It's a little bit more immediate. The, probably the, um, the verse that brings it home, uh, to, 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 for those of us who were raised in a capitalist culture, and our minds are formed in this market culture. Probably uh, the verse that brings it home uh, most clearly to us is Leviticus 25, 23. Can I have a volunteer read that verse? The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. With me you are but aliens and tenants. Leviticus 25, 23. Let me read that again, just because I want to read it twice, not because you didn't get a, get a great job. But it's just such a powerful verse. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. With me you are but aliens and tenants. So we see the, this verse has three parts. as a middle, and then two corollaries on either side. In the middle we see, for the land is mine. This is God talking. So here again is that idea that the land belongs to God. And the land belongs to God. And here, the, the translators translated this land because if you tr tried to translate it as earth, it wouldn't make any sense. So here they had to translate it as land. It's Eretz, land. The land belongs to God. And then uh, the first corollary um, at the top is the land shall not be sold in perpetuity. The land shall not be sold permanently. Those who buy the land aren't the ultimate owners. Just because you pay for it with money doesn't mean you're the ultimate owner of the land. That was the basic understanding in Israelite law. Now, this was not the case in Roman law. When Jesus comes along centuries later, Israel is dominated by the Roman Empire, right? And under Roman law, human ownership rights of the land were absolute. If you bought land, it was yours forever in perpetuity until you got rid of it. You could do whatever you wanted to with it. Uh, but not in, in Israel, not under Israelite law. Under Israelite law, the land ultimately belonged to God. Now here in the United States, we have kind of gotten a little bit of both, right? Um, our, our laws have been influenced by the Bible, by the, uh, you know, the, from the, the, the Hebrew tradition. But we've also uh, inherited a lot of Roman law. You notice a lot of our legal concepts are in Latin, and we have Latin on our coins. And the architecture in Washington and many of our um, uh, uh, government buildings is Roman architecture. We even have an eagle. Now it's, it's the North American bald eagle. But the, uh, the, the Romans had eagles on their standards. So we've inherited a lot uh, of our legal, uh, our legal tradition, our, our understanding of land from Rome. So we tend to think that Whoever buys the land is the ultimate owner, right? But that's not even true in the United States. 
because they want to run a freeway through your, through your, through your yard or an oil pipeline through your land. Suddenly it's not yours anymore. So, um, but in, in the Israelite law, it, wasn't under, it was understood that the land belonged to God. So maybe the, even the oil pipeline wouldn't happen uh, for different reasons. And then the, uh, on the other side of this, we see, with me you are but aliens and tenants. So, um, you know, we're used to th thinking of some people as aliens or foreigners and other people as citizens. Some people are tenants, other people are owners. You know, that's just the way we think of everything. But God says, no, with me, you are all aliens and tenants on my land. This is the great equalizer. Equality runs deep in the Hebrew scriptures, in the story of Israel. So Israel's story uh, begins with them as an enslaved people escaping out of bondage in Egypt, right? That's their origin story as a nation. And then when they are wandering in the, in the wilderness, we get the manna story. And the manna story you know, isn't just about God providing for them. It is that. But it's also about God teaching them and forming them into a particular kind of society. So when God provided the manna, they all went out to collect it, right? And I like this picture right here. This is, to me, this is like the first day the manna comes. And they're all scrambling. They're, they're grabbing it. They're grabbing as much as they can. And somebody whips out their smartphone and takes a picture. <laughs> <laughs> so there we have it. But, um... They're, they're all grabbing it. They're, they're getting, and it says some people gathered more, some people gathered less. But when they measured, what happened when they measured it? Does anybody remember? What happened when they measured it? It all weighed the same. It was all, everybody had what they needed, right? So no one had too little, no one had too much. In fact, it's very specific. They each had one omer, per person in their tent. So the same. One omer per person in their tent. So the, the young, strong guy who had thought, well, I'm, I'm faster, quicker, I can gather more than that guy over there who's, you know, he's old, or that woman over there who's disabled, I can gather more. It didn't work for him. Because when they measured it, he only had what he needed. And for those who couldn't gather fast enough, they also had what they needed. It wasn't a competition. And, and God was forming them into a society where everyone would get what they needed. And if you tried to hoard the manna, what would happen if you tried to hoard it? It doesn't keep. It doesn't keep. It, it spoiled, right? So you couldn't hoard the manna unless, it was, unless the next day was the Sabbath and you could only save it for one day. But you couldn't hoard it. You couldn't sell it on the open market. There weren't disparities of manna wealth in the camp. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, this is, and God, God is forming them into a particular kind of people. And we can see this when they enter the promised land. What kind of society was going to be set up there? So first of all, uh, when they enter the land, the land is divided up equally among the tribes and clans and families. Now you look at the map and you say, well, that doesn't look equal. Manasseh's got a big piece right there. But it's because the tribes were not all the same size and population. But the text is very clear. Uh, uh, the land will be apportioned. Excuse me. The land will be apportioned as shares, each tribe according to its enrollment, according to how many people are in the tribe. That's that's how it got divided up. It was divided up equally. And then uh, Numbers twenty-seven makes a big point that women could 